Welcome, welcome. Great to see everyone. We are excited to get started here with our monthly Sip Scout party. Welcome. Yeah. I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of the Crafty Cast. Craft. Ooh. I haven't even been drinking yet. I can't even tell you. These aren't even open. Look. <laughs> I am the founder of the Crafty Cast, where we are all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers like the wonderful, seriously wonderful craft makers we have to tell you about today. Yeah, we've got quite a selection. And my name is Evan. I am a certified sommelier, a certified cider professional. Um, and I guess you're kind of boozy expert for the day, but we love learning from other people as well. So while we're talking about these lovely ciders and cider in general, uh, we would love for you to chime in and share us your experiences with these ciders, other ciders, your experience with cider uh, broadly. And um, yeah, we hope that this is an edific edifying experience for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I just threw a little chat in the chat saying, chime in here to let you remind you where that is and help you find it if it's been a little while since you've been on Zoom. We were all such pros for a while there, and yeah. now we're now we're not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free to utilize the chat, yeah, uh, as well as the Q and A section. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that and either answering your questions live while we're talking, um, or responding to them in the Q and A section. And at the end of our session, we'll uh, take the time to invite you all to join us uh, live and in person. Um, <laughs> as it were, and uh, promote you to panelists so we can see your smile and faces and learn all about what um, you enjoy with regards to the ciders that we tasted today. Like um, we just promoted the panelists, Eric Madrid of Press Then Press, Hi, Eric. who is responsible for curating and helping us secure all of these delicious ciders for you. So we'll leave him as a panelist here. Eric, if you want to unmute yourself or turn your camera on and say, Hello, that would be amazing. Hi, folks. This is Eric. Hello. Pleasure to be with y'all. And I just cracked my first cider. It's tasting mighty fine. I hope y'all are catching oh, up. Too. Yeah, we're behind the we're yeah behind the curve here. We just got started, and we're just giving a little a little house clean housekeeping house cleaning housekeeping. <laughs> Who wants to come clean my house? <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're going to start pour ours as well. This is the order that we're going to be drinking them in here. So the Alpen Fire first is what we're going to start with. Um, and for everyone who's here, yeah, maybe throw in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from. We're going to keep this in webinar format for, um, or, you know, we'll do the webinar format the whole time. But we're going to keep it just us and Eric for as long as he can join us, um, you know, chit-chatting, talking cider, doing some polls, perhaps, to see what you guys know about cider. Um, and then, you know, once we get through the educational entertainment, whatever you want to call it, edutainment, yeah, edutainment portion of the evening, um, we'll, we can promote everyone to panelists. So we'll promote everyone to panelists. You can take your, turn your videos on, unmute yourselves, and then it'll be more of like a happy hour scene where we can get down and dirty with, with all the questions and cider talk. <laughs> so um, I guess to get started, we should... First, cheers. Cheers. Yeah. You should first cheers. Cheers, I'm Eric. A little, poor little line out yeah, here, too. Yeah, we don't want to leave you out of the cheers. Hey, thing. cheers. Cheers, everyone. Eric, thank you for bankers. joining. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. Mm. Gosh, I haven't tasted this one in a couple weeks now, and <laughs> it's just like, it shocks your palate a little bit. It's that first, especially for the first sip, it's tart, but mm -hmm. like quenching and bright. Yeah, I think the bitterness of this really helps to kind of provide that quenching characteristic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eric, do you want to tell us a little bit about this cider or Elfenfire? Or do you want to put you on the yeah, spot? Absolutely. Sure. Happy to. They're one of my absolute favorites. So anytime I can pump their tires, I will. Um, so Alpenfire Cider is uh, based in Port Townsend on the Olympic Peninsula up here in Washington State. So if you're even just familiar with the shape of Washington, that awkward uh, short piece of it on the far Pacific Northwest edge is where Port Townsend is. It's actually the only rainforest in the uh, lower 48 is based out there. So oh. anyway, they are, they're based in a really quaint uh, part of the state, which is far removed from what's commonly known as the Apple Capital, uh, which is in more central Washington, where folks get a lot of their red delicious eating apples all over the world. But uh, they are one of the uh, oldest traditional cider makers in 
on the West Coast, one of the very first uh, certified organic cider makers in the US. They make uh, traditional English style ciders primarily. Mm -hmm. And this cider is their uh, heirloom cuvee, which uh, has a recurring release that's always a little bit different. But um, the overall theme of this uh, kit here is to introduce folks to all the different palm fruits that are most commonly included in any kind of cider or cider adjacent beverage. So palm fruits being the apple, pear, and quince primarily. There's a few others, but those are the ones most commonly in a uh, cider or a wine. And I, I love this cider. It is so approachable and it's a very good eye-opening cider for folks who might have otherwise only experienced more large scale cider production that's often very sweet. And uh, to tie it into what Alpenfire is doing here, the common difference between the different, uh, the more mass produced ciders and uh, this cider and a lot of other fine ciders like this is that uh, the sweet apples that we're used to uh, eating and are available at the market or the grocery store have almost no tan and no acid qualities to them and don't make a very interesting cider unless it's left very sweet or if it's flavored with something else. And so what you're getting here is a blend of bittersweet apples, yeah, which have sure. more tannins and bitter sharp apples, which have more tannins and acid. And so you, you said that bright acid that just wakes you up and that little bit of bitterness, which is, you know, tannins, wine drinkers are very familiar with tannins. They have that astringency or that dryness uh, feel to them. And then you still get so much good fresh apple or bruised apple character from this, despite it being dry and with all that acidity and with all those tannins. So I think it's just a really nice, uh, it's a good cider that can be a good eye opener for folks who are relatively new to finer craft stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And this is 100% apple. Um, and so that's kind of what we're, the, the fun thing about what we're doing tonight is this palm fruit variety that Eric has so nicely put together for us is taking us on a little journey, really. Um, and so we're looking at three palm fruits. So apple, pear, quince so whoever said quince was not a palm fruit in our poll here and, <laughs> um, and then a blend so these are all 100 percent of those fruits and so we get to see the nice like what does an apple bring to the table when it's in a cider what does a pear bring to the table what does quince bring to the table um and then the fourth one is <laughs> backwards um is this palm trinity that brings all three together and so after you kind of taste these three you can kind of see how they contribute and play and kind of have a party together in your mouth. And so if you're not opening all four of these tonight, if, you know, it's just one of you doing this or you want to save one, I would really encourage you to at least drink all four of these somewhere near each other so that you would kind of still have a memory in your brain of like what the apple tasted like versus what the pear so that you can get to this one and kind of see that fun interplay. Um, Eric, your comment about this being uh, an English style with Elf and Fire it's interesting because while it's not cloudy, it does have some characteristics that remind me of the grumpy type mm -hmm. uh, yeah. English ciders that you find in the West County. Um, and I think it's that kind of that bruised apple, that uh, that almost that element of, dare I say, blue cheese. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, now I want blue cheese with that. That would probably be a delicious pairing. If anyone has blue cheese in their fridge, go try it and report back. And would you say that that's something that they're aspiring to and as people that are trying to kind of emulate English style ciders, that's part of the characteristic that is definitive for, for Alpenfire? Yeah, absolutely. Alpenfire specifically, uh, they they grow on their estate orchard, primarily English, uh, you know, originally from UK uh, cider apple varieties. So um, they're becoming more and more common across the U.S. and cider makers and you know, growing their own uh, U.K. bitter sharp and bittersweet apples, uh, as are a lot of French cider apples. And, you know, the apples that have been used for cider for a couple thousand years now in Europe that were the original apples planted across the United States for the same purpose, making cider, but that, you know, because of American prohibition, we saw commercial commercial orchards transfer to, you know, making primarily sweet apples. And so uh, Alpenfire, uh, I'd say it's about 90% of what they do is English style apple varieties, um, but they have about 10% of French bittersweet apples uh, in the mix now, as well as some uh, 
you know, some apple varieties that were originally found here in the United States too, but that are also bitter sharp or bitter sweet. So they are very much driving towards traditional English style ciders though. Uh, so that's cool. a good call out that it reminds you of a scrumpia. It has a lot of those same flavor characteristics. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, scrumpy. It's just so fun to say. One, I yeah. scrumpy ciders all the time. <laughs> but it really just means uh, traditionally, historically, if memory serves, is a essentially an, an apple that was was off. And probably that meant that the apple itself had probably begun to ferment inside the apple and people would take a bite. Because, you know, apples generally, you can store them in your cellar for a very long time prior to refrigeration. You would have to keep food in your pantry, in your in your cellar uh, to survive the winter. And if that apple tasted a little bit off, it was referred to as scrumpy. And it was more likely than not beginning to ferment on its own. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it is kind of fun. And for those of you, you know, who are wondering, where do you learn all this crazy stuff about cider? <laughs> um, Evan is a certified cider professional. So we'll tell some stories tonight of how I studied abroad in Spain and cider was my very first love when I was 19. Um, and, you know, really fell into it and then was disappointed in the U.S. market when I got back here and then fell in love with it again as the craft cider revolution brought up and was so in love with cider when Evan met me. Um, that I just kept talking about it and having him try them. And he was- Why doesn't like, this lady stop talking about <laughs> apples and cider? Like, and then, you know, and he's like, cider, like Angry Orchard, like, <laughs> you know, and like, so, sorry. And Angry Orchard makes some beautiful things from their Walden facility, just to be fair. Like the stuff you find in the grocery stores is not all they do. Um, but so my I was passion- inspired. My passion was so infectious that he, you know, the sommelier trained, I'm all about wine, went and studied his little butt off and got to taste a lot of cider. To take the With exam, yeah, to take the exam to become your willing assistant. Willing assistant. With the, so, so there's an exam to actually become a what's it called? What, cider certified cider professional. No, but, but the next, the next step, the next one. I haven't done this yet. And this is Eric, I think. Eric, are you a sommelier? Sommelier. Yep, certified hey. sommelier. Yep. So both yeah. with my wife and I, who run Press and Press, are certified sommeliers. There's uh, which I guess we've been talking about palm fruits now. It's a nice pun. It's a rip off uh -huh. of sommelier, but also for the palm fruit beverages. Yeah, exactly. So there's, there's a couple of handfuls of you, right? Yeah, I think it's close to 70 now. Uh, not oh, quite. Wow. So, yeah, there's been a couple of cohorts of people who passed the exam here uh, in the last six months or so, but there's that's still very few relative to either a Cicerone for beer or a sommelier sure. for wine. Kudos to you, sir. That's impressive. Yeah. Thank you. It's required a lot of cider, but it's been a fun journey. <laughs> Tasty journey. And, and now you own a cider shop. So, it, you know, it all works out. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so to answer our poll question, the which is not a palm fruit, Trixie, Trixie, pomegranate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so pomegranate is not a palm fruit. And actually, interestingly, botanically, it is considered a berry. So anything that comes from a single flower um, with one ovary, if you will, and have several seeds in them are considered berries. And so based on the way it is grown and it is it's botanically a berry. I've read that mm, biblical historians suggest that pomegranate that was is actually, actually what Eve bit into. Right, the forbidden fruit. Not an enjoyable bite into no. situation. There's a reason that they forbade that like gross. <laughs> it's gonna break your tooth. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, we mentioned briefly, a few more people have joined. Eric is joining us from Press Then Press. They curated this beautiful selection for us. They have, honestly, I was going to say one of the best, but probably the best craft cider selection online. Um, and they deliver all over. You know, we've often talked about shopciders.com. That is a, an amalgamation where you can look up all these cider kind of makers all over the country and find the ones that ship to your state and find the ones that are nearest to you. So that's another great source where you can find individual cider makers who will ship to you. But the nice thing about Press Ben Press is he has a variety of ciders so you can make a mixed kit like this yourself. You can get four or six or 12 um, and get them shipped directly to you. So check out Press Ben Press. You have on your Sip Scout report a nice little discount code in there. So Cider 10 for $10 off. Um, but yeah, this is lovely. And what I love about this first cider is I think the perception, is it still true, Eric, that a lot of people, you know, coming into your shop or whatever, talking about cider, still think cider is just like sweet and sticky and like kind of girly. Sorry, that's not yeah. perfect. 
that, <laughs> absolutely it's it's still very misunderstood it's um you know it's having a renaissance and it, no matter how you look at it that's true the you know the macro data shows that there's nice growth between regional cider makers you know the likes of all of these brands that we're featuring today uh and there's some uh I don't, I don't know the right word losses year over year or at least you know shrinkage from the larger more uh, macro and national producers so there is some some change in that and uh, but for the most part the consumer is still not as familiar with just how nuanced cider can be you know the history of cider the styles of apples that make really good cider uh, i've mentioned bitter sharps and bittersweet apples these are apples that you probably would never want to eat um, but they make really delicious cider, the tannins and the acids drawn from them, the range of characteristics that you can get from them. It's a beverage that can really be just as uh, diverse and interesting as any wine or any beer, um, but doesn't get that same type of respect or yeah. understanding from the commercial you know, consumer market more broadly yet. But um, that's changing, hopefully. Um, and But it, we get a lot of folks who find us and... Uh, they'll say, hey, I, I haven't liked a lot of the ciders that I've tried, but I know I like dry ciders. And this cider, I'd actually say, is probably semi-dry. Um, really? You would call this semi-dry? It's, it's, it's got tannins in it that might make it feel more dry than it actually is. Um, but it still has a little bit of sweetness there. Um, but the... I can see that. It, it's somewhere in the dry to semi-dry range. Yeah. There's definitely ciders that are a lot more dry than this. Mm -hmm. Uh, part of the conversation we have with folks who come to us with that type of understanding of cider, it's like, from what you've previously experienced, all 400 ciders in our shop are going to be relatively dry to the sure. sweet stuff from larger producers. But um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a fun conversation to have. There's a lot of aha moments and eye opening moments for folks in uh, tasting cider with them, and it's really remarkable. Uh, a lot of the customers that we work with, they'll they'll order a box of cider from us. They'll ask us for our recommendations. We'll try and include stuff that touches all over the fringe of the flavor profile, different tannin levels, different acid levels, different sweet and dryness levels, you know, range of flavor characters. And then something really sticks out to them in that second and third box. It's like, okay, we hone in on what, you know, what they enjoy most. Hey buddy, we got a Pomalier in training over here. The little hey, all right. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it's interesting how flavor profiles can you know, balance each other, complement each other sufficiently to the point where the perception of dryness um, might be kind of obfuscated by the tannins or the acidity. Like the absence of all all three of those components, you'd be very readily capable of saying, oh, that's dry. But when there is tannins and when there is acidity, the way that those kind of can cut through and pull that sweetness off your tongue so that you can have a more, I guess, complete, uh, well-rounded uh, cider. I don't know. I mean, because some that are completely dry and have no tannin and have no, I mean, I guess they're still going to have some acidity. Yeah. They're a little bit more one-dimensional. And that could be much exactly what you're looking for, but they might not be as uh, alluring, perhaps. Yeah, very. most commonly cider makers are blending different apple varieties to achieve uh, some sort of balance they might not be going for you know perfect balance they might want something with more acid or more tannins um, but uh, blends are more common uh, but when just as in wine there's a lot of single varietal ciders that are really exceptional cider app apples don't have the brand recognition that you know a wine grape does um, and there's opinions out there that vary where folks think there should never be a single varietal cider it's going to be lacking in something but there's a lot of cider makers who are doing more and more single varietal ciders that are, you know, very interesting. They're Beautiful. an expression yeah. of place, the, you know, the terroir and the differences you can get from uh, the same cider apple, but grown on the West Coast or in the Northeast where it's colder, different climates, et cetera, can get a nice range of complexity, various variations just from one apple to the next. So um, it's fascinating to get into the weeds with this stuff. and. Uh, you know it, the rabbit holes are fun they're tasty and yeah. it's it, it's just a interesting and un, misunderstood beverage yeah for Science. sure
And hey, our crew here nailed this one, 36 pieces of fruit on oh, average geez. to make a gallon of cider. Um, great job that you all got it, you all got it right. No, I didn't share that there. Um, yeah, let's move on to our second cider, this independent Perry snow gem. And if you hold that up again, I, I mean, well, if you're drinking it at home, hold that up. This has a beautiful blush to it. Mm -hmm. It really just has this beautiful, yeah. like very light, almost almost pink, I feel like. Yeah, it's just like kind of orangish, pinkish tinge to it. Yeah, and it's really just a beautiful. And these are all Danjou pears, if memory serves, right, Eric? Yep, uh, Dianjou pears. And so uh, contrary to what I was just saying about apples and how often the apples that you would buy to eat in the store don't make for the best cider um, we've been eating dianju pears our whole lives they're sweet but they still have uh, a depth of character that comes out very nice in uh, ferments especially this one i think it's one of the cleanest representations of a dianju ferment that i've ever tried and um, it doesn't have a ton of complexity in terms of acid or tannins which there are uh, peri pears, so backing up a step, you know, yeah. peri is 100% pear products, uh, which is different than a pear cider, which is a co-ferment of a pear and apple. Uh, this is 100% pears, and it happens to be a single varietal, 100% Dianjou cider. There are uh, just as many bitter sharp and bittersweet and feral pear varieties out there that make really um, complex ciders I wouldn't or peris I wouldn't say this peri is complex it tastes just like a really nice clean uh, Dianjou pear um, but light and of interesting notes uh, for pears there's a sugar compound in them called sorbitol ah, yes I'm so glad I put that poll question up before you said that because oh my goodness <laughs> no it's perfect it was I perfect think I knew Great. I, mean, I actually skipped a few because I was like, uh-oh, we're drinking a pear cider. There's no way we're not going to talk about sorbitol. So yeah, four, <laughs> okay. four out of our five people got it right. Sorbitol is the right answer. Um, I had people put in the chat for bonus points, throw in the chat why it matters, why that matters that there's oh, sorbitol really in there. And so, so we got one guess, color, and that's a good guess because we were just talking about how this has a blush and this is beautiful. And so good guess, but not quite the answer. Eric, I'll let yep. you continue with what you were going to say. Yeah, the uh, so sorbitol does not ferment out like almost any other sugar does. And so there's always going to be a natural sweetness in a peri. Even if you find the most tannic or acidic pear and make a single varietal peri with it, there will be some residual sweetness. Yeah. Um, and with the Dianjou, which is a sweet pear anyway, it's a little more noticeable. Um, and there, there is, it, it will also impact the, not necessarily the color, but the clarity. There may be like a opaque, uh, not opaque, but a um, hazy or a cloudiness, really light to a lot of peris because of, in part, the sorbitol. But um, yeah, so a peri will always have a little bit of sweetness. And so that's why you'll often have a pear cider that even if it's made with sharp or bitter sharp apple varieties, if it has, you know, a pear that's part of that blend that adds a little sweetness to the experience. So. Yeah, and honestly, because of that, for a very long time, um, you know, I was really primarily just drinking apple ciders when I was really getting into this. And as I first started trying pear ciders, I was always just a little like, yick. Like there was a, something in the back of my throat. There was something, it almost, it almost was like artificial sweetener tasting to me versus real sweetener tasting. Mm -hmm. There's that little like discerning difference. Yeah. And, um, and that, but so I feel like quality wise, it's much harder to find a really delicious, amazing peri than it is a craft cider nowadays. And there's less people yeah. making peri as well. Um, but when you find them, so another peri producer that I really love is Hemley Ciders in California. Oh, sure. yeah. um, they use Bosque pears, I believe, primarily yeah. for theirs. Um, but their original dry, I used to joke, was like my go-to, like always keep them in the fridge when I just want to crack something open and like refreshing, was that, that was my go-to. Um, so when you find a good pear cider that you like, hold on to it and like tell everyone about it because they're beautiful mm. and they're beautiful. Um, you know, beautiful. what's funny is that sorbitol is actually used as, as a, a non-sugar sweetener. sweetener. Yeah, I think you're right. Oh, yeah, totally. So if you, uh, I want to add though something Suzanne said, if you find a peri product you love, you might want to buy a box of them because they age exceptionally well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they, they have. There's a unique part of the tanning compounds in pears that, first off, ciders that are well made will age exceptionally well too. 
Um, but peris have a difference in their tannin compound structure that uh, age to aging well. Um, literally 10 plus years. Wow. You, if you find, we have a few in our shop now from UK. Uh, Tom Oliver, a legendary cider mm -hmm. and maker. Mm -hmm. We have some peri in our shop right now that the fruit harvest season, I think was 2011. And wow. uh, he bottled it in 2013. And it's still one of the most delicious things in our shop. It's uh, sure. um, the, uh, but you're also absolutely right. Like peris are more difficult than even ciders, which some would argue are more difficult than even making wine. But the pears yeah. from just growing them, uh, maintaining the trees, they're more fickle than apple trees especially peri pear varieties. So yeah. the, the spitters that you wouldn't want to eat necessarily, they don't do well next to other peri pear trees. So it's, they're, they're rare to find and they're rare to find really well. And then when you get to the point in the process, uh, like with this independent peri to make one that's super clean like this, delicate, soft, uh, and just some nice pear characteristics without any off flavors in a peri is pretty difficult. So fine peri is really something that um will probably once once cider gets its you know just due here in america i think peri will be right on its heels and probably become even more uh highly sought after because of how rare it is to find something that just is very very well done but yeah and that ageability factor with regard to people that you know achieve a measure of appreciation where they would self-proclaim themselves connoisseurs being able to have like a peri seller would be a fun like mark of let's yeah. uh you know let's joust but who's yeah. got a better <laughs> who's got a better peri seller <laughs> hey do you want to talk a minute we were thinking like making cider versus making wine about cannons in wine versus cannons in cider like the, the grapes versus apples and that yeah uh, that, i feel like that's a valuable like that's thing to touch on and i think it's it, uh, like people think about and talk about cannons and wine all the time, you know, I feel like the yeah, average sure. consumer is familiar with tannins and red wine, even if they don't fully understand what it means. And it's interesting. And it's valuable with, with this comparison yeah. and kind of dovetails into something that I wanted to, to chat with you a little bit more about, Eric, which is which is sorbitol, because um, there's some nerds here, myself being one of them. There's some nerds here. <laughs> this is what we do. We we geek out about craft food, guys. This is, this is what this is all about. So in, in like the most technical description, there's also no such thing as a dry wine. Um, the same way there's no such thing as a, a dry peri. And it's simply because in addition to the easily fermentable sugars, uh, I think fructose being the easiest, followed by sucrose and then glucose. And as you go along, the bigger these sugar chains become, the harder it becomes for yeast to break them down into quote unquote digestible components. Um, and then Sorbitol isn't fermentable because it's not truly a sugar, right? It's a, a alcohol derivation. And I'm just, this is just my recollection from one, the certified cider professional training, and then also chemistry. Anything that ends in ose is a sugar. Uh, xylose is an example of a sugar that doesn't ferment in grain. And then sorbitol, like alcohol, ethanol, uh, is, it's a, it, chemically not really a sugar in the truest sense of you know what biochemistry teaches us about these, right. these structures does that ring true to you yeah that that's my understanding i don't you seem to i think you understand that one a bit better than i do even but uh, i've heard and read the same things uh it's not exactly a sugar uh in that sense but it's, but it's uh, sweet it's sweet it has a sweet yeah it has a, a sweet flavor and um it, it doesn't ferment out but i the only other uh sugar that i know that has a similar effect on a beverage is lactose when it's been used in milk stouts for example sure. um and there's and, things like like glycol in radiator fluid which is sweet which is why it's very dangerous when you've got a dog if you have a radiator leak because no. they'll lap that up thinking it's sweet no. something that they should be drinking yeah yeah um and then the, the connection to that with sweetness and then tannins, particularly with the first one, was the fun fact that tannins in, in grapes and tannins as a result in wine um, come from the skins and the seeds. The flesh of grapes is- Have no tannins. Yeah, absent of tannins, whereas 
By contrast, with Apple, there is tannins throughout the entire fruit. Um, mm -hmm. And so you really can't get away from tannins entirely right. when you're making a cider. It's kind of a fun variation. And that's it. where it's like, so if you think about that a little bit, if you're a red wine drinker and you're a red wine lover and you love those tannic reds, like, it seems weird, but like, start getting into cider because like in the summer when you don't want a red wine, right? Like this is a great way to get that panic kind of mouth running like bite that you enjoy, especially with foods and things, but from a crisp, cold, refreshing beverage, right? It would almost be like if a white wine had tannins in it. Yeah, um, the thirst quenching nature of this is in no small part due to the yeah. tannins. And that's also why I really love orange wines. So, sure. or natural or um, skin contact wines, whatever you want to call them. That's a whole other debate <laughs> that we're not going to get into. Um, but, you know, orange wines are similar because they are white wine grapes that are left on the skin a lot longer. So because they're left on the skin longer, they have more tannins. And so it's like a white wine with tannins, kind of like a white wine with tannins, right? Like it's all, like as you start to understand this stuff, it allows you to break out of your mold of being like, I really am a red wine drinker and start to like expand in weird directions that don't seem related, but are super related. And yeah. if you're a beer drinker, if you're a sour beer drinker, get on over to the ciders, especially the Spanish style ciders, right? And we can talk a little bit about that. So that's what we're all about. We're all about diversifying your drinking experience and enjoying your palate. all of these things. <laughs> um, with, I would say with cider, the, um, you know, just to, as far as like lowering the barriers for understanding cider, just trust what you're tasting and try to explore different for sure. ciders that uh, might have apples listed on the label that you've never heard of. And uh, specifically tannins and acids is what you'll find within each of the you know the fruit how it's how it's the fermentation is managed will lead to you know a diversity of flavor characteristics as well and yeah. uh, the skin contact for grapes that uh draw the tannins out of or grape skin that uh draw the tannins out during the winemaking process is one of the reasons i've often heard the real uh, hardcore cider lovers explain why cider is so much more difficult. And that's not to say winemaking is easy. It's obviously, <laughs> uh, but when you're dealing with a, with a product that you can't really control the tannin level of it, uh, whereas a winemaker can continue to taste, you know, what they're punching the grape skins back down into and see once it hits that uh, balance they're seeking and tannins, then, you know, they can draw the skins off or what have you. But, and apples, it's you can blend different apple varieties. That's why that often ends up happening to reach that achieve, you know, the right level of balance and tannins and acids and whatever else. But it's just when you find one that just has that perfect balance with robust, rich characters. Oh, the quince is tipping. Uh, Got it. It's just it adds to the appreciation for a cider for me to know that there's not a lot of control that a cider maker has over this and. Uh, we got a gusher a little bit a little bit just a little bit just probably because little little we're knocking them all around over here <laughs> um yeah no that makes perfect sense eric and that that's a good you know one of the things you said i wanted to comment on was um what was it i just lost it in the in the excitement that's happening over here <laughs> um oh, i'll come back to me wine making cider making tannin control blending <laughs> it'll come back to me it, 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 it was something good I had something genius to say, you guys know. Um, well, I did want to say, oh, I know what it was. It was tying it to this poll question because you Perfect. mentioned, you know, when you look at ciders, you may not recognize some of the apples on there and like, don't let that scare you away. And I would say, if you don't recognize the apples on there, go for it. Like, yeah, because yeah. honestly, those are the most interesting ones. Um, and so related to that, our poll question is, if you ate an apple a day, how long would it take you to try all the apple varieties that are out there? And the answer is much longer than you think it would be. But you guys got it right. 20 freaking years. 20 years. Yeah. Like, how many apple varieties are there? There's, there's, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 7,500 recognized apple varieties. Now, this is not exclusive cider apple varieties. This is sure. apple varieties totally. across categories. Yeah. I think domestically, there's maybe around 400 or so recognized cider apple varieties. Mm -hmm. Um, is, is that ring true to you, Eric? Yeah, the that said, absolutely. But that said, that it's also a very open-ended number. Uh, interesting about apples is they don't grow true to seed, where 
you took a seed from an apple and you planted it, there's no telling what kind of apple that tree is going to produce. Um, they have a more complex DNA structure than even we do. So the child trees of any apple seed are less likely to be, uh, and the fruit that they bear is less likely to resemble the seed that they came from than you know, if we have kids and how they resemble us and how we sure. resemble our parents. So, uh, so the Johnny Appleseed romance is one where it's like, okay, even just, it's a true story except for what's lost and uh, how it's been told is that these seeds were growing trees that nobody knows anything about you know, what they were expecting in that tree. And more often than not, it doesn't lead to a sweet apple. So those, all those trees were planted for cider. Like cider is the American beverage and originally was. And um, the variety of apple you're going to get probably had more tannins or acid than people were willing to eat unless they cooked it down with sugar and pies or they let it ferment in a barrel. And so there's a lot more than even, you know, 7,000 or so, um, but yeah, most of them sure. are un, unnamed. Uh, haven't been you know, discovered or what have you, just feral growing apple varieties that uh, we commonly just call crab apples. And um, sometimes that's because of the size, but it's often just, uh, you know, there, there's so many more out there that haven't been propagated and grafted yeah. to make sure that they continue to have, uh, you know, more than just the individual tree they came from. Yeah, that's an interesting point, I think, to, to uh, touch on with regard to propagation is that when you plant a, an orchard or similarly when you plant a vineyard you're doing that from cuttings so that you can retain you know the uh like the start characteristic markers of whatever it is you're planting so that you can have you know a whole orchard of the Anjou pears as opposed to yeah. whatever they might become with the genetic variation that occurs when you plant the seed. Uh -oh, are we going on a field trip? We're on oh, a field okay. trip. So yeah. just uh, this this spring, I planted a little orchard in our backyard. I'm going to see oh, if I can get here. So I don't know if you can quite tell, uh -huh. but this baby tree is only a year and a half old. And then this year, right, uh, you probably can't see, right here I fused on. Yeah, that's the grafting, huh? Graft of a specific apple variety I wanted to grow. So this rootstock is going to give this tree all the vigor I want it to give. But in order to grow the apple I want, you have to take the smallest cutting of this scion wood. And then on any tree, fruit or otherwise, the only living part of it is what's immediately underneath the bark. And so that little green layer right underneath there, you need to fuse perfectly with the rootstock and with the scion wood. And then ultimately everything that grows above this graft union will be the apple variety I want. But if a blossom comes out and turns into a branch below the graft union, it's whatever the original apple stock was. And there's no telling what that's gonna be. So <laughs> well, that, that's interesting, not only as it relates to, you know, if you wanna make good cider with specific apples, you, you have to go through that process, but that is also how in America, what's unique in the cider culture is prohibition wiped out cider apples in so yeah. many commercial orchards that were originally built for cider. And for now, those... I feel like this is a hotly debated kind of topic with cider pros. I feel like there's some cider people who are kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's not really the reason. But like, I, this is, this is, it makes perfect sense, I think. And I tell this story all the time too. And it's fitting because we have some of our earliest presidents up there. So we're going back in history a little ways here <laughs> um, for our poll. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I, I was, when you were talking earlier about the different, you know, varieties that we just call crab apples and we don't even, you know, know what they are. Um, I wanted to talk about Shaftesbury's Lost, Lost Apple Project and Ethic Cider is doing a lot of this as well. And like, you know, and talking about like what people are doing and why they went away in the first place. But before we do that, I don't know if you guys yeah, saw me lingering with my nose in this freaking glass for a little while. This alma is crazy. This, this, yeah. alma, this alma was so crazy that the first time we tasted it, and we love all of these, but this one is just like a weird, wacky, like, we like to say it break, it's a break your neck drink. So we have drinks where we're like, you know, we drink it and we're like, oh, that's good. And we like keep drinking. And then we have other ones where we're like, hold what, it. What the F is going hold on? It. Like, you I know, can't continue this conversation for yeah, a little while. Yeah, seriously. And that, yeah. especially the two of us together, you know, but, and this is one of them. And the first time I smelled this and still tonight, I keep saying, and I don't know how else to explain it, but the nose on this 
it's light and feathery, like cotton candy in my nose, kind of, because it has some sweetness to it, but it's also like tart. And it is, it's just fun, like nothing so I've ever like smelled. wildly floral and aromatic. It's really yeah. just. And it's like light and, and like textural and... almost. Like it's really quite fun. And the, it's the like bitterness and the like funky, like weirdness on the palate. I don't think I've ever had 100% quince cider before. So no, that I... was part of the yeah, like, It's very rare to find 100% quince. Almost all quince products. And so co ferments and it's usually apple, maybe some pear, but you know, a little bit of quince. It's rare to see more than 5% quince in a uh, quince cider, but th this one's 100% quince, and I think it's remarkable. I, uh, it's hard to describe because quince has such a distinct flavor and aroma, and um, there are several varieties of quince, just like there are pear and apple, but uh, some of those floral uh, characteristics you're getting in that otherwise undescribable aroma is just the flavor of quince. So. Uh, we've been helping a lot of folks study for the certified pomalier exam and we make sure to give them a quince product so that they can identify the flavor of quince because once you've had it you'll find it in a product that doesn't have any quince it's like oh this reminds me of quince yeah. it's kind of floral a little bit of a almost vegetal bite to it sometimes um but not in an off-putting vegetal way uh, yeah, yeah. And, it, it does have like a savory note to it kind of yeah. Um, like really interesting and I, I think the first time I ever even heard of quince honestly was oh god this was like such early days of the crafty cast when I first founded it I went down to Paso Robles and visited Bristol Cider House and they do English style ciders the uh, owner's from England he owns a winery as well I forget which winery is down there um but we did a video with them talking all about their ciders and how they make them and they had a co-ferment with quince and I was like what's quince and it's it a has, restaurant in San Francisco. Yeah, it is. It is a restaurant in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's so interesting. And ever since, like, you do notice it a lot. So now that you guys have tried on the 100% one, which, honestly, you're in a small group of people, because it's kind of rare, um, you'll start to see a lot more that blends have some quince in them. Um, it is pretty common to use it because it has such an interesting characteristic to add to cider. You know what yeah. it smells like this time? What does it smell like this time? And I think it's maybe because we just tried this recently. Mm -hmm. The age, uh, that twenty-year-old Alsatian Riesling. Mm. That kind of almost like sweet petroleum. I could see that component. I can see that. Oh yeah, Lone Madrone. Right. Lone Madrone. That's the winery they own. There's a. There, I should know if somebody's tasting this and just dislikes it. Uh, you're not alone. Like cilantro or coriander. There's a even smaller percentage of people that just have a genetic turnoff to the taste of quince. Um, kind of like cilantro tastes like dirt to some folks. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. it, so I think it's remarkable. This is it, it. We've increasingly gone down a list of fruits that are harder and harder to make really well. Yeah. Um, the practices for making these beverages are exactly the same, just like with wine, you crush them, you juice them and you ferment them but uh they a quince product there's so many out there that it just tastes like a mixed fermentation gone wrong it's got you know sulfuric all over the nose it's hard to get past that but um this one's clean it's a true expression of the flavor and the smell of Beautiful. quince. it's and, so fun yeah yeah it, for sure it, it's there's a bit of a groundswell movement for quince too so all of these things are obviously you know to scale relative to most things and cider overall isn't as popular as it should be but sure. um there, there's folks lobbying to have quince be its own category for awards because so many folks are finding a uh um you know themselves making really nice quince products so you can go to these cider award shows and there's multiple peri categories but quince gets lumped into another so far but a lot of cider makers are starting to flirt with the quince Cool. I love that. See, all y'all Sip Scout members are on the cutting edge of like things that are up and coming and trending and like that's what it's all about. <laughs> and just for those of you who are unfamiliar with Quince again, the same way you wouldn't want to eat a crab apple, biting into a Quince is not, one of the like not recommended. least recommended things. Oh. The only thing I would dis like recommend less with regard to biting into an actual food is probably an uncured olive. Oh, those are bad. I've done that before. <laughs> you're in Italy and you're like, oh, there's olives. And you like taste it and you're like, oh. um, but funnily, Kristen is saying that if you can find a bunch of quince somewhere, there's a recipe that she loves 
that has quince in it and a whole bottle of wine in it. Oh, nice. An almond tart. That sounds delicious. And Eric, you pointed out something pretty fun that the word Alma is Hungarian for apple. And, you know, maybe not surprisingly, apples come from that part of the world. Yeah. They come from what is now known uh, as, as Kazakhstan. Yeah. Um, and apple has, yeah, uh, derived into, you know, a lot of different words in a lot of different languages. I yeah. Think Soul. soul in Spanish. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. The funny. idea that an apple is a soul, or mm -hmm. is the soul of a culture. Yeah. 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 I think there was actually a documentary that they showed that someone made at the Franklin County Cider Days a couple of years ago in Kazakhstan. That was something about. I vaguely remember that. Yeah, that would be interesting to find in a lot. Yeah. I think there is something about like apples in Kazakhstan and like the origins and yeah. yeah, and how interesting that is. Yeah, um, there's there's an imported product that we're trying really hard, and I think we're going to successfully pull in uh, just for us first time in the U.S. That is cider made from the apples growing in the apple forest in Kazakhstan. So cool. I have no idea how good or bad it is. I expect yeah. these trees are hundreds, if not you know, more years old. So that's typically. A good sign for the quality of the product mm -hmm. but um interested to try it on the least but yeah uh, cool. yeah so alma is uh in his his name is dave it's a very small operation in his own right he's won a lot of cider awards um but uh he's also an orchardist that has helped a lot of other cider makers plant he's got an ambitious goal to plant 100,000 uh, cider apple trees in his lifetime as part of his orchard business too so there's, yeah Wizard of Oz of sorts on a lot of other cider projects on the West Coast. Yeah, the correct answer for our poll here, Don Adams, he drank a tankard. What's a tankard? We know what the measurement of a tankard is. I, I mean, know. sounds like a lot, but he's like less than a gallon, more than a cup. I'm thinking like a tank. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking like the leather thing that you'd put it on your hip. Oh, yeah. Sure. You know, like it, I don't know. So John Adams apparently drank a tankard of hard cider every morning with breakfast, and he was known to be the longest lived U.S. president of his era. So, you know, Lived as to they say it, apple a day. The right old age yeah. of 90 years old, which, you know, that many years ago, I can't imagine life expectancy was much more than like 60. Right, right. Are we ready to try the blend, everyone? Are we ready to see these three? Beautiful expressions. The, the marriage of the three? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. I've got um, to look up and remind myself if we even know what the percentages are on this. So. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Jay, I'm not sure if horses like apples because they're local to that region, but, you know, maybe. I do kind of feel like there was a horse, there was a horse part of this documentary for sure. In Kazakhstan? Yeah, yeah, yeah that I'm remembering. Um, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, but look at the color on this one. Oh, this is like a rose, a rose orange kind of. There's a uh, Italian cheese called pecorino sheep milk cheese, mm. and there's also an Italian grape varietal called pecorino oh, uh, nice. from the same region. Huh. They they go very well together. Like I'm not suggesting you pour them together. And, uh, <laughs> but that's one of the, your favorite rules of pairing food and alcohol. Well, it grows, it grows together, together, goes together, goes together, right? Yeah. That's why like. Dijon mustard and Pinot and you know all that kind of stuff. So Kofi uh, are obviously very popular these days. Interesting about this uh, Trinity Palm blend is it's, it's uh, blended after fermentation. So uh, the notes on what percentage of quince in this product are it varies every year based on what they're trying it. to achieve in the drink. So. And so for people who are like wrapping their heads around that, there's two different ways of doing co-ferments. I, I imagine you can put all the different fruits in a bucket together and they kind of ferment and marry that way. Or you can make an apple ferment, a pear ferment, a quince ferment, and then blend the actual liquid together. Is that? I think most folks would say co-ferment is blended previous, prior to fermentation. They ferment together. Okay. Uh, which is very tricky because all the native yeast and microorganisms that exist on each fruit can have a different impact on you know, whatever fruit they're not natively on. So, but uh, a cuvee post fermentation or a blend post fermentation is a bit different. It's more like, uh, you know, a fruited sour or a fruited cider, which is very common. Uh, you sure. know, 
typically sweet and they taste more like the fruit than the cider. That's, uh, you know, after the cider is fermented, they're adding more fruit. So this is more like taking three separate wines and blending them, which is kind of like that, but not necessarily a co-ferment, um, which especially with quince, you know, the flavors that are involved, I can see why Wildcraft does that on this. Sure, sure. Yeah, and Wildcraft was another one of my earlier kind of discoveries when I was really starting to get into this during the crappy cast time. Um, and what I discovered of there is that honestly, go on and look on it. Maybe you know if they have this in stock right now, um, but go look for it now because they always sell out by Thanksgiving. And I have given them the feedback time and time again that this is the best Thanksgiving cider. They make a sage cider. And oh, it yeah. Is killer like and you know with things like this you can it can be too much it can taste kind of soapy it can be and like they just put the perfect amount of sage in it and on your thanksgiving table with stuffing and it is just like yeah but they're oh i think i think they release it in the spring typically and it usually sells out by summer and yeah. i don't think of it until like october and i'm like you guys you're doing the backwards <laughs> stop releasing it in the spring for my sake yeah yeah <laughs> I think they already sold out of it because it's starting to fly off our shelves. <laughs> we still have it. But, but that uh, means they still have it and you can get it. So go get some because yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> it's nice and it'll hold up till Thanksgiving. But um, so a, a quick note, all four of these ciders and Perry's and Quince products are from the Pacific Northwest, but from yeah. very distinct uh, fruit growing regions. So uh, wild crafts in the Willamette Valley in um, you know, Oregon, which is very well known for some of its wines at this point and increasingly becoming a cider powerhouse. And that's where Wildcraft is. Yeah. Alma's in the Skagit Valley, which is just north of Seattle, south of Vancouver, up in that area. And they're big time tulip and fruit growers. And so they've got really rich soil conditions for growing fruit. And then the independent Perry is actually grown in the apple heartlands of central Washington. So I um, thought that was a unique twist. Yeah. 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 Uh, so Dryden is the more like traditionally known part of the wine growing, or I'm sorry, the grape growing, the apple it's growing region of central Washington. That's where Dryden yeah, it's, is. It's just outside of Wenatchee and the very popular town of Leavenworth, which is in the central Washington Cascade Hills. Um, that's the most commonly known towns in the area. Wenatchee, if you pull into Wenatchee, there's this sign the size of a two or three story building that's just a big apple and says welcome to the apple capital of the world and i promise you if you travel i've been to really uh, remote parts of costa rica and some fish uh, markets and an hour outside of hong kong a bunch of other places and seen a red delicious apple and turn it over and there's a washington sticker on it and all of those come through wenatchee which is probably the 15th biggest city in washington state but it's just a um, it's a hub for commercial apple growing and, you yeah. know, within two hours of there, but almost all of it is fruit that is horrible for cider. And so, um, that said, because of its, its legacy as a, as an apple culture, you get anybody who's, uh, you know, on our level of nerdiness about app, about these beverages for them, it's apples. And so you get the orchardists who grow, you know, smaller orchards with the apple varieties that make, um, great cider so there are very good cider makers in that part of the state too they're just less than one percent of the overall apple production from the area that makes sense cool and i love this question about cosmic crisp do you want my diatribe or uh... so i was actually going to say before you jump into your diatribe um a Kristen, i agree with you if you bite into an unripe persimmon you are in bad shape for uh, sure. yeah. but those ripe ones that make you feel like an animal because it's just dripping down your face <laughs> are like incredible um but i was just going to say let's i'm going to promote people to panelists so people can turn on their sure. videos or you know we can jump into happy hour yeah, we've tried all four we've talked about four. the four um so i'm gonna you'll get a little notification that says you know you've been promoted to panelists you do not have to accept it if you just ignore it you'll just stay as you are okay. um but if you want to turn your video on if you want to be able to unmute yourself answer talk back get sassy with us <laughs> it's all good um but with that yes let's hear about cosmic crisp yeah, so Cosmic Crisp. Um, the only part of me that loves Cosmic Crisp is that I'm a graduate of Washington State University, and that's who came up with the Cosmic Crisp apple. So go Cougs. But <laughs> as it relates to, um, and this this carries over to my view on uh, food systems more generally. There's the Cosmic Crisp apple was 
uh, it's the byproduct of basically lab work where it tries to maximize the fruitiness, the juiciness, and then the shelf life of apples. And there's a place in the world for making sure that apples can last through an entire season and in growing conditions that are usually subpar for uh, you know, growing apples so that more parts of the world can have fresh local fruit. So that's the extent to which I will give Cosmic Crisp its props. It's otherwise uh, the results of capitalism, like legally you can only grow it in the state of Washington. It's been you know, trademarked, if you will, uh, in that way. And uh, for cider though, like it's a very delicious apple. Um, it's it, for eating, it's sweet, it's juicy, it's crisp, it's just, it's very nice for that, but the uh, it's it's just a sweet apple with no tannins or no acid. So in a cider, it doesn't do much. Um, it is high in sugar content, so increasingly popular are imperial ciders, which are just high ABV ciders. Almost all ciders made with traditional cider apples are equally high ABV. But on the mass on the grocery store, I don't think I've oh. seen imperial ciders. Have you seen that term yet? Don't think I have. Is that a newer marketing? Yeah, it's a term? it's a marketing trend the last year and a half or so, and it's just a boosted alcohol cider, usually, um, you know, with a high sugar, low tannin, low acid apple. They put it in a can, and it's eight nine percent. But well, the um, the apple purist, and specifically the cider purist, but any orchardist uh, will uh, will tell you that there's been more money spent trademarking Cosmic Crisp and then marketing Cosmic Crisp than has ever been properly given to. Know, the farmers who could better utilize that uh, that uh, benefit of a lot more people than just the people capitalizing off of cosmic crisp apples. So, um, sure, I mean, it's the same idea with organic, right? It's like who who gets the money from all these fees for organic? And there's so many farms that are technically organic, but they just don't yeah. pay the money to get that label and they can't help you. Like, it's just or the mess. sterile corn seeds that Monsanto sells, and if they find them on your property, yeah. then they take your property. <laughs> all, yeah. sorts of, all sorts of craziness. Tom and Steph, hello. Jay, hello. Kristen, Zach, we're thrilled to have you all here. Um, the name of the game was happy hours. Just like if you're at a real bar, you got to just like push on in and unmute yourself <laughs> and start talking over us and get, <laughs> get yourself in there. So don't be shy. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear what you think of these ciders, whichever ones you opened, even if you didn't open all of them. We're going to have a lot of drinking to do tonight. We're going to have to invite some yes. over. <laughs> um we still have a couple of poll questions left yeah we'll get be, through all those enough. uh but this i think is, this, this one, is a guinea this is a giveaway because we already kind of talked about that. washington, washington. Yeah. What, are some, what are some of the other popular cider regions that are cropping up i know new england is like that's where i'm from and that's a really hotbed for cider um other areas that are really New, so New England and Virginia have the oldest history of yeah. cider growing in the U.S. and there's some okay. great cider cultures there. Um, New York, of course, the Hudson Valley, all the way yeah, up. Yeah, they make some beautiful Italy. ciders up there. I feel like there's a lot of single varietal stuff going on up there specifically. Okay. I feel like they like that up there. And uh, California, of course, uh, all throughout California, there are small pockets in different parts of California that have some rapidly growing cider cultures. Um, and even, you know, we should give a shout out to parts of Canada that have really uh, oh, yeah. robust cider cultures. And uh, you don't have access to all of those, but um, so many of those areas are just an extension of here in the Pacific Northwest or New York. There's um, Michigan? Is Michigan has a very big apple culture. It's mostly sweet apples. There's a lot okay. of cider makers out there. Um, it's a blind spot for me. We've traveled most of the country specifically for cider, but even though my dad's from Detroit, we haven't done upstate Michigan yet. So that's next on the list for us. Cool. That's great. What's the one that we really like in uh, North Carolina? Oh, Botanist and Barrel. Yeah, yeah. Botanist and Barrel. Mm -hmm. North Carolina is on the list of 10 most uh, states with the most apple production. So anywhere there's a lot of apples, there's, it might be in the fringes, but there's awesome cider out there on the Sure. Trail. Does Georgia rain in that? Like, I know we grow a lot in North Georgia, but I don't know if they actually make much cider. There are, I've only recently learned of three or four cider makers in Georgia, um, including only one that uses cider fruit grown in Georgia. Um, oh, interesting. Just, just like in wine, the untold secret of ciders, there's people pumping out juice from all parts of, you know, New York and Washington that sell trucks of juice to folks. And uh and they, so there's a couple cider makers that I know that make pretty good cider in Georgia that are using Washington and 
uh, ironically, uh, uh, or not ironically, but oddly, uh, Colorado apples. So I should say the Mountain West has a nice growing cider scene too, um, but they're just spread all over. The only place, I think the only state that has a cidery that doesn't, but that doesn't have any cider fruit growing in it is Florida. So everywhere else has something. Um, there's a couple cider makers in Florida, but the growing conditions there, they get their juice from New York or elsewhere on the East Coast. Yeah, I think wine is the same way. I think all 50 states have wineries and all four, 50 except Alaska grow grapes in them for wine production, for better or for worse. <laughs> There's some uh, some really fine ciders that the trees that have survived there for longer than the cider makers have been alive uh, just make some profound flavored beverages. Like we have a bunch of stuff we just brought in from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where they're using foraged fruit grown on the slopes of the mountains of the Grand Tetons and in the Yellowstone Caldera and the it's crab apples and it's sweet apples, but you would never know it to drink it just because you taste the minerality of the growing conditions and the concentration of sugars because of their very cold climates. It's uh, it's fascinating. I don't know if that's true in grapes or not, uh, where there's just areas that grapevines thrive despite you know very suboptimal growing conditions, but you know otherwise very cold, uh, rocky soils are producing some. It's just the trees that have managed to live for hundreds of years without any kind of orchardist care in Wyoming, of all places, you can taste it when you pop a bottle. It's unlike anything, even if it's 100% of one apple variety like Macintosh, and I can get a Macintosh cider from every other state in the U.S., they take not, taste nothing alike. It's really remarkable. Well, yeah, I feel like grapes are kind of the same way where, you know, it, it, they're vines, so they're resilient they're hardy they can kind of grow anywhere what they produce you know if it's a really rich soil with a lot of sunshine and water the grapes are going to be tired and boring and full of water and flabby. flabby and not particularly compelling uh, but it is those challenging locations that tend to produce fruit that has the most character yeah for sure so I want to ask Kristen a little bit or have a chat with Kristen about um, Spanish cider um, because Kristen was lucky enough to join me and I was lucky enough to go there um, where we went to Gijon um, and also San Sebastian, Spain. So I actually studied abroad in San Sebastian, Spain when I was 19. Um, and so that was my introduction to the world of like alcoholic cider was Spanish cider that you're catching from across the room in a cup and like really you know this whole deeply cultural experience that is you know that people drink food is all one um and so that you know is one of the founding reasons of the crafty task for me and i was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to go back to Gijon and then tack on some time in san sebastian this gosh three years ago Kristen, something like that Time has called? no meaning anymore. You know, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but Kristen and her partner Patrick joined me for this, and I think they both fell really hard in love with cider and Spanish style cider in particular after being there. So I don't know. You want to talk a little bit about the cider culture with me? Like, yeah, what? sure. Yeah. I mean, I, it was really fascinating also to see the differences in the culture because region. it is really different between Gijon and. Yeah. Basque region. Yeah, one is Asturias is kind of the, the region, and then the other is Basque, Basque. country. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think like it was it's fascinating to see actually the different styles of cider, but then the different culture that's developed with them. And I think Patrick and I in particular fell really hard for Asturian cider. And yeah. it's really hard to find outside of Europe. Um, so it's like difficult to get your hands on here, but we really love it. It's just it's very, I don't know, it's very dry and very simple. Um, and I love the, the cultural aspect of because they don't uh, carbonate it, um, you actually have to carbonate it yourself with by pouring it into the glass right before you drink it. So as a result, if you're drinking a glass this size, you would probably only pour like this much anytime you want it and you take a little sip. But there's all all the culture around it is fantastic too. Like 
just groups of young people um, congregating next to the ocean on, on like the ocean wall to drink on a Friday and walking into what we would call a little bodega to get a bottle of, of cider to share around. And usually just one glass too, to share around because again, this is pre-pandemic, pre-worry about those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But the cultural tradition, because you're just pouring a little of it to carbonate it right before you drink it, is to pour yourself some drink and then pass it along. Um, and to leave a little bit in the glass to actually pour on the ground to rinse off. It, to disinfect it in, in a sense, because you're supposed to right, you pour take it a sip out. from one side and then dump it where your mouth just was, and then you pass the glass to the next person, and they do the same thing. And so the video that I just showed was actually in Basque Country, so I did the backwards first. Sorry, I already had it pulled up. But when you're at the barrel and they're shooting it across the room, that's the way they do it in Basque Country, straight from the barrel. For the same reason, though, to kind of carbonate it and let off some of those volatile acids. I'll pull up what Kristen's talking about now, which was Asturias, which is very different. I mean, they really, I can't do it because I, if I stand up in the camera, but they really, they hold the bottle straight above their head and the glass way down here and it pours all the way down in front of you. And I remember when we the first got there. Skill. And and that's how you're supposed to pour it if you buy yourself. It's a learned skill, for sure. Are, it's not you something were, you're good at right away. I can't remember if you were there yet or if it was before you arrived, but um, we had a like weird little walk-in shower in the place you were staying. And so Patrick and I just stood in the shower and practiced in the privacy <laughs> of our shower because you spilled so much on the ground. And we were like, we can't be out in public doing this and just like dumping out our whole bottle of cider. <laughs> like it is, it's a really funny thing but once you get the hang of it and everyone does it everywhere like so, like fancier restaurants they actually have these mobile carts that they push around the restaurant that they stand in so that if they do splash or spill a little bit it's like caught there and it doesn't get on the floor um so it's it's a weird but the more casual cedarias just have sawdust on the floor like yeah. you go to like a relatively nice cedaria and it's sawdust because you're spilling it all over the floor because that's how you drink it and yeah it's, and it is it, just, it just, feels great and it's actually. fascinating well and the cultural thing I just remember visually the cultural thing as I was like man anytime you go out to eat anywhere if you look up there's just a bunch of people standing around with their arms in the air like it's just a visual like whole, like you don't see that anywhere and it also makes you realize how everyone is drinking cider like yep everyone's drinking it like they drink it like water like no one is drinking other things really and it's just it's it's an incredible like I like I'm so annoyed that you weren't there with us <laughs> and, <laughs> but now I just have to go back and do it all over again because it was it's just one of the most drink immersive cultures I've ever That's so interesting too like the the visual like awareness of it just if there if there's an auditory awareness it'd be like every time someone ordered a beer somebody blew an air horn yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. it would be something like that it's very, it's really interesting. You, you've been there, Eric, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, so family. that was uh, my wife and I, my, our last name is Madrid, and this wasn't by design uh, because of that. We went to Madrid, Barcelona, and San Sebastian for our honeymoon 15 or so years ago. So it's been a while, but we, we did the, uh, we didn't get into Asturias, but we did a bunch of Basque hopping around and, um, I'm yeah. telling you, man, get to Gijon, because I was like, since I studied abroad in San Sebastian, I was all about Basque and San Sebastian. And Gihon, from a cider perspective, has completely replaced that for me. They're they're delicious. That so those barrels that you were showing with the long pours and the tossing from the barrels, they uh, restaurants from Madrid and north up into northern Spain will go in there when the around this time of year, actually more like a month ago, I guess, and they'll do tastings across all the barrels, and then the restaurants will say, "This is the barrel. I love this barrel. Give me X many cases for their restaurant for the rest of the year." And then what's left gets blended into um, bottles of stuff that does make its way to us. Um, sure. And so you get a more uh, predictable flavor from one bottle to the next. But otherwise, you're in, you know, one of these cedarias that have just m these massive oak barrels, and every one is so different. Uh, I mean, they they all have fresh green apple, some acidity, even a little bit of acetic volatile acidity to it, um, which is uh, appropriate for the style. But they're lovely and i mean cider in general i think is the best alcohol pairing for food especially french english and spanish ciders um but yeah just the, the culture and just the food and the cedra and the vibe it's everybody's popping bottles of cedra all the time it's incredible yeah, yeah. it's really here so here's 
another this is in G or outside of Gihon a little I bit. I was wondering if you were gonna show this one. Yeah, this <laughs> yeah, was like this also one the most... wall one. Yeah, this this was also like the most magical lunch. So this is like the perfect this example of this adorable lunch. little town in northern Spain, tiny, tiny little fishing town, and in a wonderful seafood restaurant and the ability to pair this like completely fresh seafood with yeah. cider and have the owner of the restaurant come teach you how to pour it <laughs> yeah. it's nice. pretty magical it was a good long pour in the wind and everything <laughs> i know the, the wind got me in the beginning i i, I got better at it over time but you, the, you're right Kristen. that was one of the first place i think was that the first place we had for savings yes that was the first place we had for savings which for savings are basically like barnacles essentially and they're freaking delicious That's goose neck barnacles they look like dinosaur eggs or something mm -hmm. but they're delicious yeah, yeah for sure and for those sure. bottles are five six euros a piece that's the other part of it. It's like, oh my gosh, you're just constantly throwing back these. Cheaper than water. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I just poured some of that Riesling. Oh, to compare it? <laughs> uh -huh. See? Quince? Geeking out. Yeah. So this is a 2009 Spätlise from uh, the Bernkastler Vineyard in the Mosul. And I, I think I was right. Put your nose in that now. Put your nose in the quince. Oh, they are kind of, yeah, that, <laughs> that like. I think it's that kind of candy, sweet petrol. Candy petroleum a little bit. Yeah. So fun. It's so funny when people hear things like that, sometimes they're like, or, you know, they're like, isn't that a bad thing? But it, I don't know, like. Don't drink gasoline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does everyone like that they've tried? What, what, are, what are your opinions? What are your thoughts on what you're, what you're drinking here? I we've actually only opened the apple because we're yeah but it's but delicious it's you wonderful have, you have some freaking treats to look forward to let me mm -hmm. yes. let me tell you yeah get get ready they're they're really all quite lovely but the, I love the apple it's so dry and fresh so yes Jay Tom and Steph anyone yeah. We're actually going to San Sebastian in August. So I was great to, it was great to hear all that um, description. Our daughter is studying in Sevilla and then we're meeting her in Madrid at the end of her semester and then spending a week at the beach before she has to come back to Texas. So, so <laughs> you're going to have an incredible time. I am happy to send you my food and drink map for San Sebastian if you would like yes. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, we're good friends to have. This is what it's all about. <laughs> We, but um, get prepared to eat a lot too, because they do the pinchos, the tapas bars there. Yes. And that's, that is the only thing you should eat there. Do not go to a restaurant that you sit down at. Do not yeah. like it. Unless you go to one of the Michelin star ones, because they have a lot of great Michelin star restaurants there too. But um, well, some of those pincho spots, you just stumble in, you have a couple snacks, a couple ciders, and then you walk out and you notice, oh, this place has had three Michelin <laughs> awards. It's like, it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. for 20 bucks, 30 bucks. It's so and, and it, that is another one of those things culturally that Kristen was kind of talking about too, where like the way you decide which tapas place to go to is which has the dirtiest floor, which has the most mat napkins and toothpicks yeah. on the floor, because that's just the culture and that's what they do. And so that's where the locals are eating if there's a lot of napkins and toothpicks on the floor. And so that's where you want to go. Um, yeah, you're gonna have a great time. It's super fun. Um, the cider house that we went to was called Petra Peggy, Petra Peggy, Petra Peggy. Um, and it's a really fun experience because not only do you get to play with the cider and pour it and try all the cider, but it's a very traditional meal that they serve with it. Um, that it's always steak and manchego cheese and membrillo and marcona almonds and it's communal and bread and you just go back and get more cider whenever you want it. And it's, it's, you're just going to have an amazing time. I'm so envious, even though I've been there twice that you're going to stand <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, definitely make sure to go for one of the traditional cider dinners. You can visit most of these cideries, you know, throughout the day, but make a point of doing one of the traditional doing the dinners. dinners. Yeah, yeah, do one of the dinners for sure. Like, and, and they have all, you know, they'll drive you out there. They'll, you know, they'll take us care of you. It's great. Um, Independent Perry, Zach. Yeah, yeah, the Perry is like a, yeah, that's a really fun yeah. one. And certainly a, a beautiful expression of a true, you know, just pear, uh, I guess it's not a cider, but yeah, yeah. Perry. Yeah. That's Perry. Nice. Perry's are 
all of these fruits, uh, you know, can be all over the place just because there's so many varieties of each. We talked mostly about apples and, you know, single varietals, grafting, et cetera. Same applies to any other palm fruit. So there's you know, varieties out there that are all over the flavor spectrum. And so that's a sweet pear. Um, and there's others that have uh, a nice rich tannins and a little, little bit of acid even. And But they, they carry that sweetness from in part the sorbitol and um, obviously the different flavor of a pear than an apple. So I'm glad you like that one. Hey, Eric, um, I don't think we really touched, I mean, we mentioned that this has a little bit of like a blush hue to it. And my recollection of, of Dianju pear is doesn't, lead me to remember any coloration in the flesh yeah what's but do they do the like skin contact because i know that the skin of those pears is you know darker yeah that's a good question i would imagine it has to be yes because some dianju pears have a blush color on the skin but the flesh is very white typically yeah. almost all peris will be very straw in color um but yeah that one does have a, a bit of a blush to it so i'll bet you they have some skin contact um it's pretty common to, especially with pears and quince because even a Dianju pear, uh, you, other than a Bartlett pear where you can bite into it and it almost is like a persimmon where it's nice and soft, most pears even are uh, pretty dense and uh, lack any real softness when you ch chomp into them. So it's common for the preparation of a pear or a cider to even shred the fruit and then let it sit together and sweat before um, you know further okay. pressing it. So I'll bet you that's what they do. Yeah, I guess it, it, to my recollection, it's not common to to peel, just because that doesn't make right. sense no. labor wise. Yeah, to no. do that, I, not, not going to remove the skin. But most of the difference is most of the time with apples, pears, uh, you, you're cleaning it, you're crushing it, uh, and then you're pressing it right away. Whereas with some pears and with a lot of quince products, you're letting it sit a little longer to extract more of the juice before you press, just to increase your yield and. Uh, achieve a you know better right because balance. they're so dense pressing it alone either are pressing harder than you necessarily want to right or you're losing a lot of the juice a lot of the juice a lot of the sugar and yeah a little bit of everything else too so sure okay yeah well kind of a random question where where does where do asian pears fit into all this if at all they are a palm fruit yeah and they're culinary so more broadly than I've, I've said like sweet versus bittersweet versus bitter sharp which are categories for apples there's also sharp apples that's like a granny smith um they're the same categories apply to pears and most asian pears are a sweet apple or uh, i was going to say more broadly you can call things a culinary or dessert fruit versus a cider or peri fruit and Asian pears are typically a culinary pear, and there are some really fine, just like with this Dianju uh, pear here, there are some really fine products made by people who have uh, really old Asian pear orchards or have access to good fruit there. So one in particular up here in the Pacific Northwest is called Nashi Orchards, and they have farms on some of the San Juan Islands out here in the Puget Sound, and also down on the Hood River in Oregon, which is another really rich fruit uh, growing region. They have a lot of awesome Asian pear single variety products and some blends. Um, so if you're interested in trying some stuff, I would look for Nashi. Now we have it, of course. I'll, I'll hook any of y'all up if you just want to try some Basque cider or some Asian pears, whatever it is. We've got most of them. Just message us and I will get you something to try out. We're, we're doing this for the love of cider. So if we can turn more people into nerds, we're all for it. Absolutely. Cheers to Amen that, man. That. Ah, <laughs> cider nerds unite. <laughs> and all craft alcohol nerds unite. You know, craft alcohol, supporting these small artisan makers. Oh, I always get yelled out. She was about to put I, a glass I down. Cheers, and then cheers. I don't take a sip, and then Evan's <laughs> like, that's bad luck. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, I mean, we're all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers with the Crafty Cast because, you know, vote with your dollars. And these people are pouring their hearts and souls and passion into making incredible products and instead of buying what's easy to buy on the big shelves and you know making big companies richer we'd rather make people richer and you know we'll reward them for this hard work that they're doing and i think you can tell by some of these examples here that they're really it's they're worth it endeavor. yeah it's a valuable transaction to like really support craft yeah. and drink craft and get the payoff of it 
and you sip them a little slower, you savor them a little bit more, you have a little bit more of a conversation with your drink. I mean, if, you, if you're just drinking for effect, all right, go ahead and do big, you know, like that's fine. But if you're really drinking to have an experience and uh, this is this is where it's at. And so we're excited for our Sip Scout members to get their kits every month and continue down this journey of exploration and discovery with us. Next month is our mystery kit, but she would, should we tell people who are here what the mystery kit is? Sure. Okay, do you guys want to know what the mystery kit is or do you want the mystery to remain? <laughs> you want to just, you want to just get a box in your, in your mail and see, see what kind of craft booze is in it? If you, if you really want, if you really want to know, you can, you can message me and I'll let you know, but I don't want to ruin it for people who don't want to know, but it's an exciting one. It's a fun one. And it's also actually from Pacific Northwest. That's right. I will say that. That's right. But we're kind of taking you on an international journey as well. Mm, so I'll kind of say that. Good clue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's going to be, a, it's going to be a super fun one. And we're excited about that. And then the following month in August, we have coming up a rum tasting um, and we're partnering actually with Pusser's Rum. So you may have heard of, um, and I always say that wrong. I think, I think it's Pusser's. I think it actually is Pusser's. Oh. Um, I don't from, know better or worse. I know. I mean, it's it's not a great brand name, to be honest. <laughs> but they've been around forever. Pussers or pussers are yeah. both like, hmm. Yeah. They've been around forever making rum. And, um, you know, rum gets a little bit of a bad rap. This is an interesting one because we're going to do a little mini rum tasting. And then we're also going to make a painkiller cocktail, which is an interesting cocktail because Pussers Rum has trademarked that cocktail. So if you have a painkiller on your menu at a restaurant, you have mm -hmm. to use Pussers Rum in it. And, and you have to use their recipe. And yeah, and it's and it's one of the earliest trademark cocktails, you know, that, that's been around. There's only a few of them out there. And so it's kind of a, a funny little story and an interesting story. And so that's going to be in August. A delicious story. Yeah, it, 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 pain, I always say painkillers are the adult pina colada. I'm like, you know, I love pina coladas. But Just like Fernet is the adult Jaeger. Exactly. Exactly. For sure. <laughs> Definitely. Um and then in September, we're doing Oktoberfest again because it was very popular. It's always popular every year. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do some Oktoberfest-style craft beers. Um, and then I think after that is American Single Malts, which oh, is a right. really fun burgeoning okay. category that it I actually like just recently designated. Yeah, it just recently got the their official designation of what an American Single Malt is. Um, there are some beautiful examples out there. So we'll get to try some of those. And then... We'll head into the holidays, I think maybe with wine for November and sure. holiday mixology for for the holidays. So we have a lot of exciting things coming Lots up. Lots of fun stuff coming yeah. your way. Yeah, for sure. Um, we do always like to be respectful of everyone's time. So as we're closing down here, if you have some questions, though, we have another eight, 10 minutes left. And then most of you know, Evan and I will always stick around and chit chat and keep the party going a little longer if you want to. But <laughs> if you have some questions you want to get in, particularly now, for Eric, yeah, yeah, Eric, so yeah thanks for staying the whole time. time. We really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and support these amazing craft makers, but also support Eric and Press Then Press, and you know, and his support get to, and yeah, and grab some ciders from him, and he means it. You know, if if you message me, I'll I'll hook you guys up and get in connection, and you can just tell him what you liked, what you didn't like, what you're looking to explore, and I'll make a little, a little sample of rock for you. Yeah, or even if you just want to know who I think in your area is making cider. Yeah. Uh, like these beverages. Um, yeah. Pretty well tapped in, so happy to make local recommendations to the degree there might be some out there. Yeah, we're happy to do that as well. Zach, Tom, and Steph, where are you guys based? We're in Dallas, Texas. Okay. But um, our favorite cider actually is just outside of Santa Fe at um, Black Mesa Winery. They have their own ciders. Mm. Nice. Yeah, you'll find on the, a lot of wineries have just a couple of apple or pear trees. And they'll, they're, there's probably a hundred year old estate, you know, back a tree that dates back to the um, homestead era. And it's because of the age of the fruit in their skills as a winemaker, it turns out really nice. Hey, Eric, are you familiar with um, Trout Bridge ciders? You say Trout Bridge? Yeah. No, that's new to me. They're um, Old World Winery, D Derek Trout Bridge. So um, he's all, uh, Old World Winery is all natural wines. So he's really into the natural wine space. And he has his own sub-brand of Trout Bridge ciders. And they are definitely kind of more Spanish style. Yeah. Just um, outside of Santa Rosa in the Russian River Valley. Oh, nice. I think he only makes one, honestly. I think he just has his right. one single yeah. that he makes yeah. every year about. Those are yeah. harder to track down. There's a lot more of them than than anybody I know even knows, but 
Every sure. time I'm in Santa Rosa, I'm at Tilted Shed, though. So it's... yeah, <laughs> or Ethic. I love not, these folks. Not far from Tilted Shed. It's maybe 15 minutes. From yeah. Tilted oh, nice. Shed. Yeah, uh, but Tilted Shed and Ethic are two of our our all time favorites over over there as well. Ned Ned's doing some fun stuff. Totally. Yeah, for sure. Well, any any cider producers in in Arizona that you know that oh. we know? Because we've only been here a little over a year now. So the Superstition Mead folks make some cider, but it's very sweet and it doesn't even taste yeah. like apples. Um, we've had those. Yeah, their meads are on the sweeter side too. Yeah, um, there is. I can't think of their name off top. There's a couple folks who make cider, including one who gets uh, their fruit from uh, somewhere in uh, the hills out there in Arizona. So there's at least one that's making it with local fruit. I'll message you all the others that uh, we have flagged as, uh, you know, folks that we're following. I forget. Can we, do a, can we do a mead kit? Maybe, maybe that's the next surprise. Maybe that's the next surprise. He, he's no, run. Uh, Hedron up in Northern yeah, California is great. great. And there's one up here in Flagstaff that mm -hmm. is doing some cool stuff too. A lot of people, similar to cider, people think of mead and they think of sticky sweet. And a lot of them are, especially more so in mead. That's a whole style of them. But there are a lot of dry meads being made now and sparkling meads, which are really fun, the sparkling yeah. meads, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're pretty fun to, to explore. So mm -hmm. that'll be a future, future sip scout. Yeah. Anything you guys would like to see in future sip scout kits? Kristen, I think you told me in the past you want an Amaro box. Yes. Uh, I would love an Amaro box. Yeah. I mean, but that's going to be really hard to curate because like, oh my God, how how would you decide like what direction to go in? There's so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, an Amaro box would be super cool or even just a box that's like a cocktail kit box that highlights Amaro cocktails so sure. low ABV, or low ABV cocktails mm -hmm. since those are becoming so cool. popular and a lot of them use Amaros. Or, I like that idea. Um, I mean, I'm excited you're doing a rum one. I would have said that, except you already said that that's coming. So yeah. I, yeah. rum is definitely one of those that I think it is very misunderstood and people don't realize that how wonderful it can be. I um, agree. I, if I had my way, I would do like six rum boxes in a row. <laughs> so there are so many amazing craft makers making rum, especially in the New England area. Um, and, you know, people just think of like rum and cokes when they think of rum or pina coladas and Sure. It's, I always, I keep saying, I'm like, move over whiskey. Like when whiskey is done having a payday, I feel like rum is going to slide in there and people are going to start to realize that there are great sipping craft rums now. Um, yeah. 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 I feel like we're, you know, sort of starting to see that with agave spirits and you yeah. know, tequila has taken off so much. And I'm really so pleased to see how much um, uh, mezcal has taken off. But yeah, I hope. I hope rum is next for sure. Yeah, we'll have to do. Um, it'd be fun to do an American agave spirits kit. There are some. There are some good American agave spirits being made now. Um, we we were just in Mexico last week for a vacation and got to drink some yummy yummy tequila. Yummy yummy tequila. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, please feel free to reach out and let us know what you'd like to see. Uh, yeah. Put on the calendar for future kits because. We would love to oblige. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's fun introducing people to things. And the research, Ooh, deciding Jamie. what to, <laughs> to offer. That's fun too. I second Jim, yes. Yeah, oh, you second Jim? Okay. Cool, All right. I like that. Yeah. All right. That's, That's what I got into over COVID was Jim. Ah, uh -huh. Wait, making different cocktails with it? Yeah. Basically, my wife's a workaholic, so every day at five o'clock, I made up a, a new cocktail to get her to stop working. Man, that's that's good, Steph. That's good. I like that. <laughs> that's a good ploy. What's the um, Evan's done that with me a few times too. <laughs> what's, what's Spanish gin that we love? Oh, Mahone. Mahone. Mahone's a Spanish gin that's really fun from Mallorca. Um, yeah. really, just delightful. It is nice. I, I would get in trouble. So Evan's done that before too, where he'll like, you know, he's a mixologist. So he'd like make these like fun drinks and bring it to me at my desk. And especially like during COVID when it's like, it's and seven o'clock now. Yeah. And they bring it to me and then I would get in so much trouble because I'd be like, oh, thank you. And I'd put it down and then I'd start to stage it and I'd start to take pictures of it. And he'd be like, it's for you. It's not for the camera. <laughs> and now it's been half an hour and it's not even cold anymore. Yeah. And, and so now we, now we have, 
just the the camera the camera drinks first the camera eats first so yeah. it's, a, it's a downside of the job you know it is what it is but we do have a rule in our house now that Evan is allowed to say to me at any time when he hands me a drink this is not for the camera this is for you and that means like I don't want you taking pictures of this one I just want you to be present and enjoy it with me I and usually I serve them in a coffee cup so they're no. not pretty <laughs> <laughs> Nice. You would never, because you do eat first with your eyes and drink first with your eyes, for sure. <laughs> and then your nose, and then your mouth. Pickle back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pickle back. That would be so funny if we, <laughs> if we sent some spirits with our artisanal, artisanal pickle, pickle brine. Well, you see artisanal, artisanal pickles whiskey. with the juice, so that would be, that, that could be a good April one for like a little April Fool's kind of joke. I like it, guys. I, I like it. it. That's great. See creativity. This is we're better together. I love it. Got to jump in here with uh, speaking of, of cider. Um, in perhaps a little bit of shame, I have to turn on my camera for this one. Um, there is a cider. A I will put in an air quotes cider producer, uh, like practically down the street from us. If there wasn't a river in the way in East Boston, called Down East. I know right. Down East. Yeah, just out of pure nostalgia, uh, they just released this. I think had to go and get this. Oh, wow. new cider! Oh no, new oh, 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 no. and it is blue. But man, it it's like childhood meets alcohol, and it's a weird mix of nostalgia. I, I saw like it online, and I, I I saw someone comment. I don't even know if the ingredients include apple or apple juice on that. So <laughs> quite possibly not. No, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, that's that's something. I feel like you need to crush up some ice and actually turn it into a slushy if that's going to be the case. Speaking of childhood nostalgia meets like adulthood, check out this book that I just picked up. Nice. Can't quite see it. Glaring down. B is for beer. B is for beer by but Tom Robbins, who wrote Still Life for Woodpecker and Even Skinny Girls Get the Blues and Jitterbug Perfume. But it's apparently like a grown-up book for kids. Well, or, or the no, tagline is a children's book for grown-ups. Yeah. A grown-up book, a grown-up book for children. And I think I think <laughs> it's all about like why dad likes beer. Nice. Yeah. Like it literally starts with like, why does dad drink beer so much? And then what it is that stuff that dad drinks every night? <laughs> kind of looks like pee pee. Yeah. <laughs> it does say that. So we're like, okay, so how old does our niece need to be for us to actually read this to her with a straight face and not get into so much trouble with her mom? <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, well, looks like we lost Eric. His battery's dying. Oh, I see. I see. Um, let's see that. We're going to say goodbye in a proper way. But thank anyway. you for joining us, Eric. Yeah, Press Ben Press is great. Go on their website and just check it out and see what it's about because they have a great variety. Um, seriously. Lots and then stuff. Shop Ciders is the other one to find individual cider makers that shift online to you and that's a really fun one just to explore ciders near you honestly or one of the few um so yeah. i hope you guys enjoyed this we certainly enjoyed hanging out with you cider tastings are always one of my favorites because i get to go down memory lane about all of our time and space oh, the nostalgia. yeah for sure one last cheers one have last a great cheers. night happy thursday happy thursday everyone drink more cider hope to see you next month <laughs> Yeah.